Good morning, my beautiful family of God. How are you today? How are things going? Are you being blessed? Are you worried? Today we're going to get into Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. And guys, this will be long. But it's something we truly, truly need to look at as children of God. So I'm just going to jump in. Verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying. God spoke to the nation of Israel. Do you understand what I'm saying? The whole nation of Israel, the Israelites, heard God speak. He didn't, he didn't just speak to Moses. God spoke to his children in an audible voice. They heard God. God spoke all these words that we're about to study. That means God gave the Ten Commandments to his children. By doing this, God has set a moral code. And whether we want to believe it or not, Everyone has a moral compass. It just depends on where you set that boundary. Also, by God speaking to them directly, God was establishing, You belong to me. These are my words. This is my moral law. And whether you like it or not, our nation was founded on God's moral law. We need to know that God in heaven who expects certain moral behavior. And yes, there are consequences from obeying and disobeying of God based on moral law. The idea of a God-based moral law is very unpopular, especially these days. While the idea of a moral law remains strong, one tends to believe that the moral law should be based on an, one's in a, individual inner sense of right or wrong, good or bad, and not upon a standard set by God. This is where we failed. The standard has been set so long ago by God. God guys, I hate to tell you, God isn't Santa. He doesn't sit you on his knees and ask, what would you like? No, he spoke to the people as a whole and set the standard as a whole. We must keep this moral law. Jesus spoke about this law in Matthew. Turn to Matthew 22. And we're going to go to verses 35 through 40. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This doesn't eliminate the Ten Commandments. It fulfills them. Jesus is saying, if you can only follow two of them, follow those two. And you will end up following all the Ten Commandments. The, but the problem is, we can't, well, we won't follow these two, much less ten. The Ten Commandments are organized into two groups. The first four focus on our conduct toward God, the most important part of us. And the next six on our conduct toward one another. So let's just jump into these Ten Commandments. Let's read verses 2 through 3. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 
you shall have no other gods before me. Here at the beginning, God reminds them of who he is, Yahweh, the covenant-making, the covenant-keeping God. And he also reminds them of where they have come from and how he has set them free. The first commandment says no other gods, but there is a word that gets us every time. Before. We take that word to mean that God comes first and everything else afterwards. It is not permissible to be the idol factory that we have always been. Also, our idols line up. It's not permissible for all of our idols to line up behind God. We can't do that because our number two in your idol lineup will quickly become your number one. What before is actually saying is no gods in his presence. God isn't some ingredient we add to our lives. God is our life. We are to flee from idolatry. Turn to 1 Corinthians 10. Oops, too far. If you can hear it, my pages are turning. And verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Idol worshiping is our worst. All of, all of our sins stand from idolatry. And if you continue down the road of idolatry, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, you don't go to heaven. Now turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we will do verses 9 and 10. Do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. This might get censored because of one certain word. But God lists, there will be some that do not make it to heaven. Now we want to think that everyone goes to heaven, but reality is, they don't. Not everyone will go to heaven. Ephesians 5, turn to Ephesians 5, and verses 5 through 7. For this you know, that, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Now turn to Revelations 21. In verses 7 and 8. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, Ab abominable murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now turn to Revelations 22, verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. 
but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Idolatry is our old life, not our new one with Christ. When we receive Christ, we become new. We must act new. And as Christ followers, we are not to associate with them. We live our life, but we don't allow them into the inner circle if they are continuously heading down that path. Christians or not. Doesn't matter if they call themselves a Christian. If they are doing against God's word, they're not living for Christ. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but God says if you're going to know my word, you got to have more than just the warm fuzzies. You have to be prepared in all aspects of life. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to do 9 through 13. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexual immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or the extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now, look, but now, I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. Hold up. Wait a minute. This scripture is speaking of Christ followers, of Christians. So if you call yourself a Christian... Be very careful that you are following Christ and God's moral law and not what the world says is okay. Hold on a second. I got to get a drink of coffee. All right, four through six. You shall not make. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep and keep my commandments. Now the second commandment goes hand in hand with the first. And to put it plain and simple, you can't make anything to worship it. This commandment does not condemn having images for artistic and decorative pur purposes. I want to make that clear because I got said, well, if you wear a cross, that's a graven image. No, unless you are bowing down to worship, that image... I think Jesus himself explained this commandment better than any man can. So let's turn to John 4. And we're going to be doing verses 23 through 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Not my truth, not your truth, but God's truth. And if we all have the same Holy Spirit, we'll all come to the same truth. When we kneel and pray to anything else, we have to put it before God. And yes, that includes our religious things, our religious traditions, our religious... Because God is not religion. 
Paul also reminds us of the danger of trying to make God into our own image. Turn to Romans 1. Oops. And we will be doing verses 20 through 23. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Oops, I'm in the wrong one. I said that I was reading 26, but that's a dollar. That's adultery. That's unnatural. It's against God's commandment. All right, verse 20 through 23. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his internal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but become futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. <clears throat> We're not to make anything in worship other than God. And everything, everything in your life has the potential of becoming an idol. Now we come to a peculiar word, jealous God. I hear all the time, God is jealous. God is not jealous of you. God is jealous for you. And that is true. For a believer. But to an unbeliever, they, get, they can't get past the word jealous. If you go to the dictionary, this word has very negative feelings. And that is just not our God. But the word's original meaning also meant good sense, zeal, zealous. Most associate jealousy with envy. But in the Hebrew language, jealous means holding on to what is yours. God is jealous over what is his. He will punish those who hate him for generations. Why? Because we repeat what we have been taught all our lives, whether it's right or wrong. We have to break bad teaching so the generations to come are not punished. But he also says he shows mercy in thousands to those who love him and keep his commandments. It is possible for everyone to receive God's mercy if we only love and obey. Number seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This is a big one, and we use the Lord's name so nonchalantly. Three ways that I can come up with in my brain right now, if you think of more, throw it out there. One, profanity. We know this word. No, I'm not going to say it, but you know it. I'm not even going to use the, the two letters that goes with it. The other, number two, frivolous. Did you ever think about using God's word frivolously? Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. That is using God's name wrong. Unless you're in prayer and crying out for help. But we hear this all the time, and we do not correct it. Hypocrisy, using God's name for our glory. Also calling yourself a Christian and not following God's commands. That's using God's name, saying you're his child, but I don't have to follow him. It's hypocrisy. We will have to answer for using God's name wrong. 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, 
you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This is so much debated issue. People get into knock down, never speaking, drag out fights. Okay, technically, if you look at the calendar that we use today, Saturday is the end of the week, and Sunday is the beginning. I don't care which day you choose, because our calendar has changed over the years. But let's follow God's lead. Work six days, then rest. You should be doing no work. You are to be physically resting in God. Our bodies need rest. Our minds need rest. We also have perpetual rest in Jesus that we should be observing daily. But God is speaking of this physical rest. He tells this is holy. This, is, this honors God. You can debate all day long about a day. Or you can follow God's lead, work, then rest. Don't debate non-salvational issues. It just breaks God's heart. Number 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land, which the Lord your God is giving you. This one we have gotten far from. This command is wise and good. Because honoring one's parents is the building block for a stable and healthy society. If the younger generation is constantly at war with the older generation, then the very foundations break. And we can see it all around us today. Notice it doesn't say to honor only good parents. It says, honor thy mother and thy father. But if parents are horrible, bad parents, you can still honor them and yet not have them in your life. And parents, just because kids are to honor you, doesn't give you the right to be dishonorable to them. We teach our children how to be honorable. And God says the reward is a long life. 13. You shall not murder. This one should be easy, but like with any of God's words, it is so misused. It says do not murder. There is a distinction between murdering and killing. Killing as opposed to killing, murder is taking the life without legal justification. Killing is like, I'm sorry guys, but like execution after due process, after everything and they're still found guilty. Execution is killing, not murdering. They have been found guilty on this earth and their life. That is the consequence of the choices they made. Also, if someone breaks into your home and is threatening your life and you kill them, you didn't murder them, you killed them. Now, I'm not saying it's right, but there is a difference between murdering and killing. But Jesus took it a step further in Matthew 5. I'm not going to turn there. But he goes as far as saying if you have hatred in your heart you are wishing death upon someone and we can't have Jesus and hatred you shall not commit adultery God offers no justification for adultery when it is done it is sin Jesus spoke of this also in Matthew 5 you can turn there we're not even permitted to even look at someone and have that desire in our hearts or minds. 
We aren't innocent just because we didn't have the opportunity to sin the way we really wanted. Guys and girls, this includes what you watch and what you hear. 15. You shall not steal. This command is an important foundation for human society. Establishing the right to personal property. If it's not yours, don't take it. But did you know that you can steal from God? Turn to Malachi. And i got to re-look at where Malachi is because my brain is fried this morning. Malachi, if you don't know, is the last book before the New Testament. <clears throat> and we're going to Malachi 3, verses 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings? You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. This is stealing financially. But we can also steal from God because of our lack of obedience. Turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 1. Verses 17 and 19. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, for your aimless conduct received by, by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. But there is a solution. And Ephesians 4 gives us the solution. And verse 28. Let me find it. Let him who steal, stole steal no longer. But rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Work to get what you need. Not working is unbiblical, guys. Number 16. <clears throat> you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. There are many ways to bear false witness. Lying, slander, repeating something without facts, silence, silence, silence is a false witness. Silence is a false witness when you keep quiet when you know the truth. If you are living in Christ, the old is gone. The new is gone. By keeping silent, You bear false witness because you hold the truth. All right, number 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The word covet means to pant after. The Hebrew word hamad, I think that's how you say it, but H-A-M-A-D means desire. Covetousness works like this. The eyes look upon an object. The mind admires it. The will goes over to it. And the body moves in to possess it. Just because you have not taken the final step does not mean you are not in the, president, pres, in the process of coveting right now. Hebrews puts it well. Turn to Hebrews 13.
and we will go to verse 5. Let your conduct, conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's five and six, guys. Jesus also gave us a special warning. Turn to Luke 12. And we will be doing verses 13 and 15. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, written in red, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetous, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. These commandments are no joke and shouldn't be skipped over. We need to follow them. All right, let's look at 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Awesome sights and sounds came from Mount Sinai. And put God's voice in there? No wonder they stayed away. 19. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. One might think you would feel honored to hear God's voice, audibly. But not Israel, and I would dare to say, not us either. They wanted God to stop talking with them directly. They said they would listen to Moses and what God told Moses. And they, would, they felt they would die if they heard God's voice. They are now with their own voice putting Moses as their mediator. But we will see that what they say doesn't match their actions. Do what we say about God match our actions? See, it's not just words and it's not just actions. It is all of the above. Guys, I told you this would be long. 20. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. <coughs> the people wanted to separate themselves from the presence of God. But Moses tells them that God is using this as a test. What is going on in your life? Is God giving you a test to grow, to come in his presence? Do not fear speaks of a fear from guilt and danger. That his fear may be before you speaks of the attitude of honor that leads to obedience. We are to have this second kind of fear so we don't sin. Israel didn't learn this lesson because we're about to see they get a calf to worship. Do you have a healthy fear of God? If you do, then you are less likely to commit sin. 21. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Drink a coffee. Israel dreaded the powerful presence of God, but Moses longed for it. This is really no different than today. Our society does not hold on to truth, respect, morals, or anything else from God. We go in the complete opposite direction. Moses gets closer. It wasn't that Moses was a saint. He was quite the opposite. He was a murderer, and we will see he has anger issues. 
but he was a murderer who had been forgiven and restored by God. If God can restore Moses, God can restore you. If God can restore Israel, God can restore us as a nation. 22 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. This scripture makes it perfectly clear that God spoke the Ten Commandments to the Israelites from heaven. He also said again, don't make anything because he knows what they're about to do. God did not reveal himself in any form or image, just in voice. 24 through 26. An altar of earth you shall make for me. You shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Here God expands on the law. And look, they need an altar for their atonement. God already knew they were going to break his commandments. So God gets Moses to get prepared. He told them to make the altar of earth. He didn't need the fancy altars from the Egyptians and their false gods. The earth was sufficient. Just as two wooden beams were sufficient for the, the ultimate sacrifice. God tells them the offerings that were to be upon it. We will look at these in greater detail in another lesson. <coughs> God didn't want it to be carved out of hewn stone. Because then we would lift up the stone carver and not God. That right there is also we have to be very careful with our pastors. Putting them on a pedestal and putting more burning upon them. No tools, no steps. God doesn't want any display of human flesh at his place of sacrifice. This way we can't say, look at what I've done. Look what I did for God. God wants our spirit, not our flesh. Our flesh will die. Our spirit lives. Have a blessed day. I will see you again when we're ready to do 21. Study these Ten Commandments. Apply these Ten Commandments to your life. And when we all apply them to our lives, we are standing in the presence of God. Have a blessed day. Rise up, you children of God. Rise up.